Good afternoon. Um, so we try to tell you a bit about what I've learned as a hard time working on a big project. Um, that there are some missing pieces in, into this presentation. Uh, you probably have other experiences, so feel free to complete what is missing. It's not a really big deal. So your project is like a cathedral, and you have to, be, to make it shining. And this is the difficult part. Uh, it can quickly crumble if you don't do it correctly. So the first question is, how big are projects right now? Um, it's not necessarily uh, have to be one million project to be a complex project. One million line of, of, of code, of course. Um, here, I will measure project by the number uh, of single line of code. That means code without commands and blank lines. Uh, this is not necessarily the alpha and omega of measuring a project complexity, but it gives you an idea on how big our project. So here, what I've done is gathering uh, many Apache projects. Uh, you have a site, on the, a page on the Apache website where you can check uh, the project size. Uh, it's on snoot.io. Uh, and you can see that you have many different sizes. The smallest I have found is Shiro which is only 86,000. And the biggest, as of today, is OpenOffice, which is more than 6 million. So you, you really quickly uh, see that projects are quite big those days. Uh, Tomcat is 583,000. It's, it's, uh, it's big. So uh, if you imagine that one million of line of code project is big, it's not that big, actually. And the risk is that your project is pretty much looking like that if you don't manage it properly, and you don't want that. OK, I'm quite old. I'm in my 50s now. Sorry. <laughs> I prefer to be in my 20s, but that's not a deal. But that means I started to work in the 1980. And in 1980, uh, the environment was totally different. You didn't have any IDE. You were coding using VI or Emacs. You didn't add um, uh, bug trackers or very bad ones. VCS, I mean, version control was very primitive. We were using SCCS or LCS. You don't want to use it. Uh, we didn't have mail, or at least on projects, because we didn't have network either. Internet was not existing, at least the way we are using it and knowing it right now. So that was very different. The big difference is that now we have internet. We can search things if we don't know uh, about a piece of software or library. We can go on internet searching for it. We have a very good network. Everybody has the ADSL. That means uh, you can search something, a big um, distribution of Linux in a matter of minutes when it was hours when I started using in, uh, my internet on my uh, telephone and it changed everything. The other big change in, since the 1980 is the open source software movement. And again, that changed a lot of things. The fact that we were able to discuss with other people all around the planet about software makes you uh, develop in a, a totally different way. So, we will see um, the way to go when it comes to manage big projects. And I will just take one example, which is a project I'm working on. But it's just to give you an idea of what we have done before going further, discussing about the code, what has to be done for the code, and more important, what is about the community. So let me present you the Apache Direct project. It's a um, 13 or 15 years old project right now. That means I've worked on it 13 years, but it existed two years before, and it was before getting into incubation. Uh, it's an LDAP server, basically, but we have added many other things, like Studio, which is a LDAP browser, and the LDAP API, which is a re replacement for GNDI and other things, a database that has been developed, and so on and so on. Um, I've talked about slugs, single line of code. The project is nearly uh, one million line of code, and I'm just talking about the code, not about the commands and blanks, because otherwise it would be one million and six hundred thousand. And you can see that it's not one big monolith. There are many sub-projects. The main one is Apache DS, which is already 
half uh, a quarter of a million line of code. Uh, the API, which is a second biggest, biggest part, is uh, 2,000. They have been split in order to be manageable. And then you have Studio, which is a browser, and so on. So all of these pieces are using each other. And we have to be careful to manage the things by uh, um, dividing the different elements in order to be able to manage them separately instead of having to manage a whole thing. So the key is, of course, to make your, your, your pro project uh, modular. That means if you want to uh, develop one side uh, without breaking every, every other part, it's easier if it's separated. Of course, you have to, to design an API properly, but as soon as you have done that, it's much easier. You can test it uniquely without breaking anything, and once the tests are okay, you can include it into the other projects. So here, you have a quick vision on how it's uh, organized. Uh, at the center of it, you have LDAP API, which is based on Mina, which is another project. Uh, it's a, a network I.O. Uh, subsystem. And above it, you have Apache DS, depending on the API, which is depending on Mina. And it's depending on Mavibot, which is a database, and also GDBM, which is another database, and so on and so on. So you can see you have modular uh, elements. And each modular element itself is also uh, built into different things. And the key here is to have layers. You don't build uh, elements without designing different kind of flavor. And here is what we have for Apache DS. The up top layer is a network. And then you have um, a backend subsystem, which has an API called intercept of service chain. And then under the last layer is a database. It's not all. In Mina, which is a network, network part, then we have also layers. So each component, each module is layered. And it's very important because, again, between each layer, you have an API. Second thing, layers is one thing. Second thing is to be able to add some components. Uh, here, we are talking about plugins. Plugins is very helpful. You can think about Maven, for instance, which is a big machine, but Mavens have many plugins, and plugins help Maven to become more powerful. You want to do something specific, you don't have to know the innards of Maven. You just have to know how to address those uh, elements. And this is what a plugin is good for. We are using um, many plugins in Apache DS in order to, uh, to be able to have um, uh, modular and easier uh, evolution system. OK, that was just to give you an idea of what we have done on Apache DS, just to tell you, OK, I'm not uh, trying to sell you Apache DS or whatever. Just for me, an example. I'm also working on OpenLDAP, which is a different system, still an LDAP server, which uses a different modular, modular uh, structure, but still it's all, all the same kind of code. So we're going to talk about the code now. This is my computer in front of my phone. OK, anyway. The first comment I will say is that you have to make your code readable. If, if you can't read the code, it's much more difficult for people to get into the code. And when I mean readable, it means don't necessarily use the smartest language that has been out in the last two years or three years. It's a smart language that has a lot of things into it, type control and so on. But at some point, you want to be able to get some newcomers who are not necessarily uh, knowledgeable, knowledgeable about this language. And this is probably why the common language like Java and C are still using, used today because they are easy to, uh, to access. Second thing, it's good to have a readable code, but code is not all. You have to command the code. I know there is a controversy about commands. Commands are useless. Commands don't uh, uh, get older. I mean, if you have a command that was good enough two years ago, but the, the code has changed and the command is still the same, then the command is not uh, in the same page. It's not commenting what the code is doing. Who cares? Because anyway, you are not executing the commands. You are executing the code. So it's easy to fix the command if the command is bad. It's not breaking the code, your code anyway. So be sure that you command your code. And even for you, I have pieces of the Apache DS server I wrote six or seven years ago. 
If I read the code, I don't remember what I've done back then. I have to read the commands I've added to remember, oh, yes, I remember this is because and blah, blah, blah. And it's always the same story. So don't remove commands from the code and add them. This is a good example. Uh, here is a page of a notebook written by a mathematician, an Indian mathematician, Srivina Ramanujan. He never uh, commented anything into his page because he was just about writing the results. Um, an English mathematician spent 10 years of his life decoding those documents. Not necessarily the best idea. So your code without command is pretty much like a math book without any explanation. Of course, you may not agree. It doesn't matter. Another way to have your code being uh, readable is to use a formatter that uh, in some way uh, removes the concern that you have somebody pushing some patches and the patches are not formatting the same way than those are part of the project. It doesn't matter because you integrate the patches and then you execute the formatter and bam, your code is still on the same style. So, and also if somebody don't like your style, it doesn't matter again, it can format itself, but as soon as it's injected into you, your code base, you have your formatter. And it's easier to provide a format uh, file that can be injected into the IDE because then you don't have to take care of those things, which are pretty painful. One other reason why the formatter is important, when you do a diff, it's extremely painful to have to go through many lines that are different because one guy is using tabs, the other guy is using space, or you have new lines all over. Another aspect which is quite annoying, and I must admit that on OpenLDAP it's something that is annoying me. Um, for some reasons, variables are very short in OpenLDAP, like one or two letters. It's extremely difficult for, for me, and probably for every coder that does not know the code very, very well, what PT means or what CN means, I, I mean, it's not talking. So you're better using better name, like uh, it's a pointer, call it pointer, it's easier. I mean, we don't have, uh, like in 9080, uh, to be limited by 16 kilobytes of memory. You have 16 gigabytes on any computer those days. So, I mean, you're not a compiler, you're a reader. All the things that helps, uh, check your code. Uh, it's, it's easy to remove, to, to, to have some code that will generate a null pointer exception just because you have not checked something. And any code checker will tell you, okay, here I'm not sure that it's good. Your uh, variable has not been in initialized and you may get a null pointer exception. It saves your bottom many times. I've ran, ran it on, on the project and I've found bugs that may have been found by users later, but it's still better that you are finding before releasing it. And the last part of the code, uh, the core code, which is important, is logging. Uh, as soon as your code is released, it goes in production, hopefully. And then this is where it blows. And when it blows, you want to know why. So this is the logging that will provide you with this information. Uh, you know that users don't give a lot of information when they say, okay, my code is not working, and you don't know anything. So if you can tell them, okay, can you provide me the logs, you get some information that are valuable to analyze what's going on. It's difficult to write a good logging system. I mean, you might generate too much logs and then it's difficult to analyze. So be very careful, it takes time, but it helps. If we get out of the code, then we are going to talk about the toolings and everything which is around the code. And here, IDE is important. Again, we are not in the 80s, and using VI or Emacs right now, it's, I mean, <laughs> it's not anymore a good idea. ID are offering a lot more than just uh, adding code. They are just also uh, helping you uh, remodeling, refactoring your code. They are integrated with debugging tools, something that VI is not. Um, 
So whatever the ID you prefer, it can be IntelliJ, it can be Eclipse, it can be NetBeans, whatever works. I mean, as soon as you are comfortable, be sure that your system can be built on any of those uh, ID, and be sure that the ID is also connected with your build system. Version control is absolutely critical right now. You can't develop a system without a, um, a source control system. Uh, I'm using Git right now. Uh, not that I love Git or whatever, but it's today's control system. It's much better than Subversion that I was using before. It's, it's not a fight. I mean, there is no mean fighting Git versus Subversion, whatever. If you are going into a project, it's, it's likely to be Git anyway, so better use it than ignoring it and still going on with Subversion or whatever. CVS. Uh, CVS died, by the way. Build. The build system is also one of the critical parts of your big project. You have to have something which is reliable. It can be Maven, it can be Gradle, it can be whatever works. But as soon as you change some code, you want to run the build system to see if you get some issue or not. Quickly, on your computer. It can be on a CI, doesn't matter. I don't really think that the CI is a good place to test your code. Before committing, you first have to check on your computer. And as soon as it's OK, you can commit it. The CI is there to catch other issues, like does it work on Windows and Linux and Mac OS or whatever. Then you have something that works. Good. You have to have an installer as soon as you don't deliver an API. Uh, installers are the best thing for users. They just have to, to download an APM or Debian installer, or whatever works, if you're NSI on, on Windows, and install it on their computer. This is the way it works. If you don't, have, if you don't provide the RPM, then your code is quite difficult to use. Of course, if it's an API, that's a different story. Now you can go at higher level. IP and license. Um, when you are delivering a project, you are generally integrating some third party libraries, and then you have to check if those third-party libraries are good for your project, comparing to your license. For instance, Apache license is not compatible with LGPL or GPL, so you have to be very careful that any of your dependencies are compatible with Apache license. And what I mean third-party dependencies, I also talk about transitive dependencies. You have tools that tell you, okay, this library is itself using this library, which is itself, and blah, 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 blah. And you have to check all of that. And you better do it before releasing, because when you, when you release, it's too late. It will be extremely painful to have to uh, roll back a release just because there is some incompatible license, besides the fact that it could cause some issues, legal issues with big companies. So check your IP, check licenses before. IP, I have an inter interesting story. Once in a, something like seven years ago, uh, some guy pushed some code. He said, okay, I have a codec for some uh, um, weird uh, crypto things, and uh, here is the code I want to push to your repository. Fine, interesting, we are missing it, so let's check it. And what I did done is, you know, I just took a piece of the code and went into Google and searched it. And strange enough, I found the exact same code, but with a Sun license on top of it. The guy just renamed the functions, renamed the, the variables, but the structure was exactly the same. So you have to do your due diligence. And it's, it's painful, but you really have to do it. Wiki is the place where you will put your internal documentation. Um, the point is, if you have some complex structures, complex code, you want to be able to explain it once instead of explaining it, explain it every time someone is asking you about it. It's easier to say, OK, if you want to know how it works, then go to this page on the wiki. Read it, and you're done. The real difficulty with wiki is to keep it updated. If you don't, it, don't do it for others, do it for yourself. Sometimes it's extremely helpful to document and explain what you have done to see if you have not missed or forget anything in your code. Bugs. 
there is not much things to say about bugs, but you have to have a, a good tracker. And also, you have to respect bugs. Bugs are a thing that there is something wrong in your software. Even if the bug is invalid, because it's it's not really a bug. It's some user not using your software correctly. That means you, maybe your API is not correct. Maybe your documentation is not correct or whatever. So fix bugs, check, check them regularly, and don't let them stay for years. Mailing list is your main communication uh, point, at least at Apache but it should be uh, the same thing. We are working with team all over the planet now. It's, it's common to work with guys in um, Pacific Coast in USA, uh, Australia, and you don't want to wake up at 3 a.m. just to have a conversation with someone uh, who is in Australia, for instance. It's not very funny. And if you have teams in all over the planet, then mailing list, because it's asynchronous, is the way to go. Plus, you can search a mailing list. It's extremely difficult to search um, a voice recorded on, on, a, on a talk. One thing could be interesting is that if you want to do some new, some changes in your code, don't refrain you to experiment. You can branch easily with source code, and you can have big experiments or smaller experiments. Well, the key here is to check something and show the community how it works. And if it's OK, then you integrate your experiment into your, into your code. If it's not good enough, you can ditch it. It's not a big deal. But at least you give an opportunity for anyone to try something different. And also, this is something for all projects. The codes tend to stabilize. And at some point, nobody wants to touch it. Sometimes it's a good idea to rewrite part of your code, even your whole code. For some part of Apache S, yes, we rewrote, rewrote it four times. The language you are using, like Java, for instance, is also evolving. So what we did in Java 4 is not any more efficient in Java 9 or Java 10. And it might be a good time to just use new features to rewrite the, the code which is antiquated. Two things that I want to tell about code. Uh, you might have a very simple code, which is you know, uh, on, running on one thread. It's on server side, it's not always the case. Every time you have insynchronicity into your code, it's going to be complex and difficult. So try to limit it as much as possible. Sometimes it's not possible anyway. And the second point is security. security. When I'm talking about security is, Sometimes you have um, security issues in your code, and that deserve some very important treatment. You open a CVE, which will be um, shown on the public mailing list later. Uh, you have to be efficient. You have to be fast to fix your security issues. If you don't fix it, then mean at some point the user will be hit by it, and that's not what we want. It, it's put a very bad light on your project. OK. I will talk now about the much more important things, about how to manage a community around a big project. If you have an open source project, what you want is to be able to attract new developers. For a big project, it's more difficult because, of course, the code is impressive. Entering into a project which is one million line of code, two or three million line of code, it's quite difficult. You don't know where to start with. So the first thing to do is to okay, attract people. Yeah, it's very interesting. You can improve this part of your code if you're interesting, and I can help you. This is a way to do it. And it's not easy because we prefer code instead of talking to people and pat them in the back. But you have to do it. That's, that's, that's part of your duty as a project manager or whatever you are. One thing I just hate about code and about people who explain that everything in the code here is people telling you, read the code. If you're just asking a question about how it's doing this and that, oh, you just have to read the code. So come on, guys. I can read the code, but the code can be complex. And if the code is not commented, or if there is no specification, it's very likely that your code is bringing some semantics that I don't know. It's it's not my code. And I will spend 10 times the time uh, to understand what you have done uh, when you could have explained it in two or three minutes. I'm not stupid, but 
I'm smarter if you explain me what you have done. So don't let people on your project to tell others, read the code. It's not a way to manage a project. A second aspect of a project, especially on open source project, is that you have people coming in, great, they are helping you for one, two years, three years, and at some point they are doing something different. That's fine. That's the way we are. I mean, you are not committed to a piece of code for forever. The thing is that as soon as a person has gone, then you have to catch up with what he has done, because this is now your code. So you have to find someone to catch up. This is one of the reasons why it has to be documented at some point. Another difficult aspect is ego. Um, we are open source people, so we do have some ego at some point, and this has to be, you know, moderated. That's good to have a good ego, big ego, but you have to be careful. Too much ego just kill your project. So keep it under, you know, a certain level. Users of your project are not gnomes or trolls. There are people that are explaining you that they are not very happy with the way your project is working. And also there are some, sometimes, and more, more frequently than you think, very happy with your project. And that's, that's the key here. Uh, be happy to have users that give you some, some good or bad uh, feedbacks. Good feedbacks, it's always, it always good for you because it makes you feel like you have done something good. But bad feedbacks, it's also a sign that something is not very good in your project and you probably have to fix it. So take your user an, uh, as an asset to your project. If you don't have users, that means you, you don't have a project. So, what about roles in the project? Um, usually, you just decide that someone will be the re release manager, another one will, will be the project manager, another one will be part of... Anyway, you have many people on the project, you want everyone to be responsible for one part, and the best of it is just to have people taking responsibility for one part. Yeah, okay, I'm going to do the release management for the next two years. That's fine. If you force somebody to do it, then at some point he might leave. So, manage roles correctly. Second point, don't overdo. Just because you are in the project for 10 years does, does not mean you are going to do everything. You are not going to micromanage people. No. Either you are confident with the capacity to manage the parts they are taking responsibility of, and that's fine, or you are not. And you are not, at some point, you are going to be alone on your project because you are doing everything. Don't do that. And on a big project, anyway, it's not possible. Welcome contributions. They are good for your project. Even the smallest typo fix is a good thing. And welcoming contribution is also a way to be attractive. That means you are inclusive. There are long discussions we had on many other projects about should we accept somebody uh, as a committer or not? That, what a question. I mean, of course you should. Even one commit should be enough to be a committer. The key here is if you want to control the project so that bad committers, or we say bad committers, it's stupid, committers that are not as good as the other ones might uh, harm your project, well, so you just can re ask them to revert. And if you are very, very uh, careful, you can just switch to RTC, review and commit. But in any case, refusing commit, uh, contribution or just putting a high barrier for committership is a mistake. So the easier you make your uh, commit access, the, the, the more successful your project is going to be. And that's why you have to anticipate those, all those things. I mean, your project is going to grow, so you have to be ready for uh, um, all those things that are going to, to, to be added to your project. Um, if you, somebody is dumping some, some code, you have to be sure that you are going to be able to maintain it, and you have to anticipate before accepting the big contribution. Um, if you have to, to, in, to have a new installer on a new platform, you have to be sure that somebody will understand how the, the builder, the um, packaging tool is working. It's all about anticipation. Don't do things that you are not getting ready to maintain in the long term. 
Another aspect of a project, and uh, we can see on many mailing lists, people you know, yelling at uh, users, yelling at other committers, fighting, and so on. People are making mistakes, that's fine. And I think the empathy uh, presentation this morning is pretty much about this. You have to be very kind and respectful to other people. Okay, you are not going to have a drink with them, you are not going to spend holidays with them, that's fine, but at some point, you don't have to. You just have to be kind on mailing list, respect what they are done, even if it's not very interesting. And the project is likely to be better. At some point, you just have to be sure when to know when you have to say no. No, we can't do that. And no means you probably can vote. At Apache, we say we should build consensus. Sometimes consensus is not possible. If a consensus is not possible, then you can vote. You can vote for or against, and sometimes it's against. Uh, in 13 years, we had three votes, three negative votes. That's not enough. Not, not a lot, I mean. And it should not be a lot. A question about leadership. Um, everybody knows it's BDFL, sorry, sorry, it's a mistake. Uh, BDFL means benevol benevolent direct dictator for life. Um, should we have uh, for a project somebody who is a leader like Linus Torvald for, for Linux? Um, it's not necessarily a good idea. Um, again, for Apache directory server, the guy who started the project left it seven years ago. And actually, we had uh, four different um, uh, PMC chairman. It's not a big deal because you aren't just managing the project, you're not managing the people. That means you, you have to be sure that everything is done following the rules and not trying to tell people what to do and how to do it. So, if you just want to know if you should have one person leading the project or not, that's a good question. Of course, if you want to have uh, people that come to your project, you have to advertise it. And advertisement, that means, for instance, doing a talk like I'm doing. It brings some light on your project on some ways. You can talk to other committers. You can talk about other projects than yours project, but at some point, you can see connection being made. Oh, you are writing a new API for, for LDAP? So I'm going to use it. And as soon as people are using it, then maybe they're going to find some bugs. They maybe just patch it and so on. And this is the best way to do it. Talking about it, tweeting about your project, um, mailing about the project, um, or even writing a blog about the project is how you advertise your project. Read your project frequently. It's the best way to show that it's alive. If you release a project every three years, that means you either you don't have bugs in your project, which is very unlikely, or you are taking bugs very seriously. So, Every project will tell, okay, once every three months is okay, once every six months is okay. It's, it's all about, you, you decide what, to, I mean, it's your call. I, I'm not here to tell you, you should release every month. Sometimes it's not possible, but remember that releasing often is more likely to, to provide some, some bug fixes to your users. Another way also to advertise your project is to bring the light on it. And uh, here for us was to send the project to um, a kind of, uh, to, it's the best open source ICP application, whatever. It's uh, an Eclipse um, I don't know the name in, in English, uh, sorry. But anyway, you, you get a stamp there. This is the best project. That's fine. This, this is good for the guy working on the project. It's good for the project itself. Uh, it, it's something that makes people know that you are uh, doing something interesting for them, maybe. That's it. At the end, your project is pretty much like this fig figure. You are just turning plates, and you really want to avoid any of them to fall down on the, on the ground and break. And it's, it's not easy, but it's, you have tools and you have ways to do it. So that's part of my talk about it. Thank you.
Yeah, thank you very much. Are there any questions? I have one. So, wh what are the best practice to introduce test-driven? What, what is the best practice to introduce test-driven development, and to uh, enlarge the test coverage in an open source project? Um, unit test, of course. I mean, you have to have unit test all over every every piece of your code. At least every piece of your API should, should have uh, unit test. What we do is generally, as soon as a bug has been filled, in, we are using Jira. Uh, we are trying to code it as a unit test to be sure that it will not reproduce again. And the second thing is that you need um, a CI system. We are using Jenkins. Um, it's quite helpful to, um, to check that it works on many platforms. So this is pretty much what, what we do. There are also other, other ways to do it. Uh, a guy presented something interesting about uh, testing, doing some QA and, and so on. But everything that, that helps your project to be, to be safer is good enough. I mean. So you talked about the issue whether it's a good idea to have a benevolent dictator for lifetime in a project or not. My personal opinion is usually that's not a deliberate choice. It either comes to being so, if there is such a person who founded the project and has such a charisma to fill out that role, the personal decision maybe, but if there isn't any person suitable for that role, it just won't happen that there is a dictator for lifetime. So usually it's not a deliberate choice, it's just an historic artifact. Or maybe you can do something different. Um, the person who is, res who is responsible for one part of the project is also responsible to ask about uh, the, the way to manage this part. I mean, uh, you don't have to have one person taking all the decisions. Decision can be collective. And at Apache Directory Server, we we don't, I mean, we don't have a leader. We we just have you know sometimes questions. Sometimes you know, even if you have been on the project for 15 years or 13 years, that, that like me, I know that some others are better than me on, on some part of the project, and I prefer asking them before doing any modification. You know, it's a whole a kind of respect you have to to pay them. They came to help you, so it's important to ask them if the modification you are doing is good enough. They are your peers, they are not high, lower or higher. I mean, this is the way I feel it. I'm not a genius too, so maybe you know, for Linus it works, but it's much, much smarter than I am. So, but it, it can work. I mean, it's, um, we are probably you know, living in a world where we really want a president, a, a king, or a dictator, and, and, and so dictator and president are talking together. That's fine, but this is not what we are as human beings. So there is no reason we should have a um, dictator on the project, in my opinion, again. So. Hi. Um, a lot of what you're saying seems to me to apply to smaller projects as well. Sorry? A lot of what you're saying seems to apply to smaller projects. So it's, it, some, some of the points you're making are just clearly generally very good practice, you know, writing logs and those kinds of things. Um, but my actual question is, um, what w are there any large projects where you admire the, the result or, or things that you would change about the project you're in if you had a, a magic wand? Because you, you kind of discuss the problems you're, you're seeing and, and the way you, you perceive it, but mm -hmm. do you see anything outside your initiative that you think, ah, I wish we could do it that way? Um, sorry, there is kind of eco, so it's difficult for me to understand, but um, your question is, uh, do, you have, um, do I have some... Is there anything from outside of your project yes. that you see that you would like could happen inside? Yes, I understand. Um, I would like to have more participants in my project, 
for obvious reasons. It's difficult when it's an old project, and that's one of the key. I've not talked about it, how you enter an, uh, a big project. Big projects are old projects, and, and they are intimidating. Um, I don't know how to get more people involved. It's especially for old projects, talking about OpenLDAP, for instance, which is 20 years old, and it's in C. That means younger kids don't do C right now. They are using much smaller language, like Scala, whatever, and it's difficult to attract uh, people that don't know C. They are scared of the project also. So what I would like to have is a way to make the project easier or, I mean, more comfortable to, to get in. So that's one thing. And another thing, uh, when it's a big project, I mean, you have cutting a release, it's a three days process. Uh, for smaller projects, I mean, you can release in one hour. When I'm committing something, I have to wait 20 minutes or 30 minutes for the test to pass. And that's something that I would like to, to, to get fixed. It's, it's not simple. Especially if, as I said, every time you have an issue, you add a new test, that means you are adding some, some, some delay on, on the testing. At some point, we have 5,000 tests to run every time we want to do a commit. So this is something we would like to, to get rid of, but it's not easy. That means probably slicing the project in different parts, so we just have to test one single part without to take care of all the parts. And uh, that's another story. I don't know if I answer your question or... Okay. Okay, thank you very much, Emmanuel. Thank Merci you. bien.